This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Today's topic will be a not very brief history of the Fulton Fund Medal, uh, which is a medal that people have known about, but very little about the background and just seemed like a fun thing to do. Now, <clears throat> like all good epics, we are going to start in the middle. And that's over here in the 18, April 1889 issue of the American Journal of Numismatics. <coughs> Probably uh, one or two issues before there was a request for information about medals of Robert Fulton. And in the April issue, Major Charles Porter Nichols responded uh, with two medals that were in his collection, including this one. Uh, which is 30, size 34. For those who don't know, that's the 34 16th standard, which was common at that time. Uh, it's actually 52 millimeters, so it's just slightly off. <clears throat> Steamboat on one side, inscription on the other. And in his response, he said, it's very rare, and uh, any information relating to this medal would be greatly received. So it's taken 133 years, but I figure better late than never. But before we get to the medal, we'll start at the beginning and we'll go to the beginning rather. And this is Robert Fulton. We vaguely remember him as the person who invented the first practical steamboat. And this is Fulton here on the right. Uh, of course it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> he embodied during his life many of the characteristics that were common during the American federal period. He was energetic. He was very self-assured, talented, ambitious, promoted himself to no end. He was something of a huckster in that he promised many things over and beyond what he really could expect to deliver. But Ultimately, he succeeded in at least one thing, and that was enough to enshrine him in the American pantheon. And, <laughs> and here we have him pictured on a $2 silver certificate of 1896 from the educational series with that other great inventor, Samuel F.B. Morse. And as we will see, both of them actually had a similar beginning in that they started life as painters. We actually know very little about Fulton's early life. There were books and things written about him very soon after he died, but they were pretty much uh, semi-fictional, if you will, you know, sort of like the George Washington and the Cherry Tree type of book where a person could work miracles since the day he was born and possibly weeks before then. Uh, there was one story about him going to a local gunsmith shop as a child and walking up said, you know, I can do that better and showed him how to make improvements. You know, 12 year old kids don't do that, but it was just the, the nature of literature at the time. What we do know is that he was born November 14th, 1765 in Little Britain, Pennsylvania. This is the birthplace, uh, look, probably looked nothing like this at the time. The building burnt down and with, by, uh, around 1820, 21, and 1822 was rebuilt and still stands, but I think this is just a much nicer version. His father was a very unsuccessful farmer who had to sell his land at auction to pay his debts. He then moved to Lancaster and took up his earlier occupation of Taylor and died penniless two years later. The, the family apparently was not very uh, upset about that. <coughs> Fulton's formal education was pretty minimal. And at age 17, he was apprenticed to a silversmith and jeweler named Jeremiah Andrews. <coughs> Andrews was born in England, came to the United States in the 1770s, and is listed in New York as a jeweler at least as early as 1774. He also worked in a number of other cities, Philadelphia, Savannah, Norfolk, and had his work sold in Baltimore and a few other places. 
<clears throat> One of his claims to fame is that he was the first person in the United States to produce badges for the Society of the Cincinnati. And here we have on the left uh, a badge from the ANS collection, and the one on the right is from uh, Andrews. And it doesn't look that good. It looks a little bit like a turkey vulture, maybe. Uh, that beak just really is odd. But uh, George Washington is known to have seen this work and was not impressed. And underneath is a transcript of one of the ads that uh, Andrews ran in Baltimore, uh, indicating that he did have this work for sale. Andrews was also known uh, for doing hair work, and hair work was jewelry that or pictures that incorporated human hair, usually of a loved one, living or dead. Uh, they were fairly popular in the late 18th, 18th century, more so in the 19th, Queen Victoria was known to have been a collector of these things. And Fulton was probably given a fair amount of this work because uh, in his earliest listings in local directories, he's listed as a painter and then as a uh, <clears throat> doing hair work. He did po portrait miniatures. Uh, we'll see one or two examples later, but uh, this is a little bit bigger. Oil panel on the left is Joe Barlow. Barlow was the American patriot at the time. He was uh, representing American interests in France when Fulton came to know him. And they had a very close relationship. Uh, all we can say really is that Joel Barlow, Barlow's wife, and Fulton are in what is was then referred to as a menage a trois. Today, I, apparently, is known as a throuple. Uh, at some point, um, when he eventually did marry, uh, Fulton tried to bring his wife into this arrangement. She was not going for it in any way and was basically sick for the entire period that the three of them were otherwise together uh, and otherwise unavailable. There is another image of a sketch by Fulton, but 1785, he was established as a painter and the following year, decides to go to England. <clears throat> While he was there through various connections, including Benjamin Franklin, he uh, got lessons from Benjamin West, the great American expatriate artist. Fulton had some minor success while he was there, but his interests were very much centered around mechanical issues at the time. Uh, he created a marble polishing machine. He got a silver medal for that. Uh, he also was very interested in canals, beginning to get interested in steamboats, uh, submarines, torpedoes, all sorts of things. We'll discuss that a little bit in just a moment. He had this rather harebrained scheme, and many of his uh, ideas pretty much were, for having lots and lots of canals, small canals and areas. And in this case, rather than have locks between sections, there would be a pulley mechanism. And if you look up on top at the pulley, there's a little uh, crank there. And a person would go up there and crank the boat up to move it from one level of water to the other. Uh, he was commissioned by a company to write a book about this. He did the illustrations himself. Uh, but the company wasn't particularly interested. And as with most people invested money in full schemes at this point, rarely saw any return, if anything. He wrote a letter to George Washington, trying to get him interested in the, his system of canals. Uh, that came to nothing, but just like the idea, these great ideas that he had that would not work or weren't appropriate for the time, just in Pennsylvania, he envisioned over a 40 to 50 year period having at least 9,000 miles of small canals built so that everybody could transport goods cheaply, travel on them and so on. And everybody can make tons of money, but nothing ever came of this. <coughs> he had other inventions. Uh, this was a submarine that he invented. He was not the first to do this but he was a very early opponent. And you can see on the outside, <clears throat> it was round uh, with a propeller inside 
there was a guy with who would turn a crank to make it move, and there was another per person who, who could hold a light in there, a candlelight. They can breathe by means of straws that would go up to the surface. <clears throat> he got Napoleon Bonaparte somewhat interested in this. Uh, Napoleon eventually lost interest. Uh, and then Fulton went to England, got the Navy to give some money, but eventually that petered out as well. And it was a good idea, but the technology wasn't there. And it could work, provided that the person whose boat you were going to sink decided to let you do it. So you needed perfect uh, weather conditions. You would have the submarine go up to the boat, sink a torpedo into the boat, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment, and you would then sail away and the boat could then blow up the ship. And in at least one or two instances, it did it. But again, you needed perfect conditions and you needed to have uh, the enemy let you blow up the boat while you're doing it. So here's a picture of a slightly later uh, version. And he tried to get Thomas Jefferson into, interested in this. Jefferson wasn't, but you would have the boat, the ship go up. You would shoot it with a sort of harpoon-like device the torpedo would then follow, you'd sail away, and the boat and the torpedoes would then hit the boat. And all the while, the guys in the ship you're about to sit were pretty much waving at you. So <laughs> it was not much of a success. <clears throat> and here's what Fulton said if the harpooning succeeds to my expectations, and it has every appearance of success, a vessel may be harpooned and blown up while under easy sail in calm or moderate weather, of which there is always an equal chance in the summer months. So you've got two weeks in July when this might work if they let you. John Rennie, who was a great Scottish uh, civil engineer, uh, described Fulton, who he knew, as, I consider Fulton, with whom I was personally acquainted, a man of very slender abilities, although possessing much self-confidence and consummate impudence. And that was pretty much what most people thought about Fulton for most of his career. <clears throat> In 1806, Fulton returned to the United States, having really been turned down for work in France, things petering out in Britain. So he came back to his country because he's such a patriot. And a lot of his attention turned to steamboats. He had actually seen steamboat uh, experiments before this, although he never admitted to it. One of the earliest involved a James Fitch, also working in Pennsylvania, and just, you know, coin people like to hear this. One of the people who helped him build component parts, uh, in this case, the engine, was Henry Voigt. And in 1791, Henry Voigt and Fitch were both competing for the job of chief coiner of the United States, and Voigt got the job. Uh, getting back to Fulton, uh, by 1807, he pretty much had a successful uh, workable steamboat. His partner in this was Robert Livingston of the New York Livingstons, known as the Chancellor. And they set up a passenger service between New York and Albany. I don't want to go into a lot of the steamboat background because that would be like another whole long period. And it's the one thing about Fulton people actually know anything about. But it, it turned out to be a fairly successful business. They began to build steamboats to run throughout the country. And the following year in 1808, Fulton married Livingston's niece, Harriet Livingston. And this is Harriet here in a portrait mi miniature, about three by four inches, that Fulton uh, did himself. <clears throat> they had four children. Apparently, it was not a particularly happy marriage, despite the children. Of these four, Robert Barlow Fulton died unmarried in 1841. And these people will actually figure in this just a little bit. Julia Fulton uh, married a lawyer, Charles Blight. Cornelia Fulton, another lawyer, Charles K Crary, and Mary Fulton married Robert Morris Ludlow. In 1815, Fulton, who was, who was already suffering from tuberculosis for many years at this point, was walking along the Hudson River, which had frozen over, with his friend and lawyer, Thomas Emmett, 
uh, and another friend. Uh, Emmett fell through the ice into the river. Fulton and his friend pulled Emmett out and doing so got soaked. And Fulton caught pneumonia, died February 24th, 1815. He's buried in Trinity Church Cemetery next to Alexander Hamilton. And this is the monument here on the right uh, on for Fulton at, uh, at uh, Trinity Church. And that's Emmett there on the left. At the time of his death, uh, Fulton left a wife and four children, all under the age of 10. He did have a considerable estate, somewhere between $250,000 and $500,000, which is quite a bit in 1815. But through mismanagement of various people, uh, it's not quite sure if it was Mrs. Fulton or various other relatives who were administering the estate. Uh, in only a few years' time, the estate was virtually bankrupt and children had very little to live on. Mrs. Fulton, on the other hand, married Charles uh, Augustus Dale towards the end of 1816, went to England, eventually came back here, but she left the children in the care of some Livingston relatives. Uh, Mrs. Fulton died in 1826. And over the years at this point, there were some uh, attempts in Congress, all of them unsuccessful, to try to raise funds for the Fulton family, feeling that the family never really benefited from this great invention that Fulton had come up with. So the first attempts to raise money to, for the family were to give cash, and these never made it through Congress. Uh, then there were some attempts to give public lands. That wasn't very successful. Eventually, in 1847, they did get $76,000, but by that time, Mrs. Fulton had passed away, and Robert Jr., the three daughters, were already adults, married, families of their own, and doing okay. However, on February 15th, 1830, there was an article in the Lynchburg, Virginia, discussing the proposal to grant public lands to the Fulton children, noting he died poor and left his children in penury. Well, we know this wasn't true. He had left a fairly good estate, but the money was frittered away or just ignored and forgotten about. But despite the fact that it was an exaggeration, Charles Carroll, who was the last surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence, uh, was quoted in an interview about that time that the, full, the family of Robert Fulton had not been fortunate enough to obtain a greater share of the benefits resulting from his improvements in the application of steam to navigation. And that seems to be what it took to get people to take some private action where Congress wouldn't do anything. On the left here, we have a painting by Michael Lady of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, and on the right is the well-known medal that was struck for his 90th birthday. And now we get to the medal, <laughs> finally. So this seems to have, been, uh, to have done the trick and people are getting uh, interested in helping the family out. <clears throat> the earliest uh, indication we have of anything happening was by the citizens of uh, Rappahannock who su suggested that boxes be placed on various steamboats that were being run mostly as ferries uh, so that well-to-do passengers could make donations for the Fulton family. July 4th, 1830, there were a group of 21 citizens of Richmond and other parts of Virginia who sent a letter to the proprietors and directors of the steamboat Richmond uh, who uh, they approved of the measures by the citizens of Rappahannock and then requested cooperation <clears throat> to follow suit. And on August 9th, 1830, the owners of the Richmond agreed to the plan and they did place uh, wooden boxes on the various steamships. Well, at least on the Richmond. <coughs> on August 30th, there was a numerous and highly respectable meeting, and I'm quoting this from a newspaper, <clears throat> uh, 
a numerous and highly respectable meeting of the citizens chaired by Matthew Carey, who is there on the left, and held in Philadelphia to consider the proprietary, propriety of following the example adopted in Virginia. <clears throat> the citizens agreed to this plan and Nicholas Biddle, who was president of the Bank of the United States, was appointed chairman, and there he is on the right. And Washington Jackson, whose picture I cannot find anywhere, was appointed treasurer. That is the last we hear of anything for four years. But then in the November 15th, 1834 issue of the Niles Weekly Register, Carey published an account of what he referred to as the Fulton Fund. <coughs> so the collection of funds was an absolute failure. Uh, in four years, a total of $8 was collected in Philadelphia. And that is just embarrassing. So <coughs> 1834, Carey receives a $10 Mississippi note which represented the amount collected in Louisville, Kentucky. I don't know if it was actually a banknote like this or a banknote meaning like a check. And I couldn't find a banknote that was dated prior to 1834. So just for illustration purposes, we're getting this $5 note here. If I don't put up that, then you're going to have pictures of happy cats or something. And you know, I understand from at least one or two people, they'd rather not see that. So, <clears throat> A $10 Mississippi note was re received, which represented the amount that was collected in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Carey made inquiries with the treasurer of the fund, Washington Jackson, uh, who was also treasurer of another fund with ha which had a small amount of money in it. We don't know what fund that was, but Jackson saw absolutely no reason not to raid the small amount in that fund Combine the two, give it to the Washington one, to the, I'm sorry, to the Fulton Fund. And that gave them $15 plus $10 from Mississippi for a whopping $25. Harry then contacted people in the other areas that had uh, expressed some sort of interest and received additional funds supposedly mostly from Richmond, but actually it was all from Richmond, uh, of $80.77, which gave them a grand total of $105.77. <clears throat> this was collected over a four-year period and was considered so small an amount that they could not in good conscience give that to the family. So the next thought was let's make a gold medal and give it to the Fulton family as a lasting memorial. And this was a pretty good idea. Uh, didn't quite happen that way, uh, but this is the medal that they eventually did strike. <clears throat> there is a steamboat, not the Claremont, which is the uh, first steamboat, although during its functional life, it was usually only referred to as the steamboat, it was the only one. Uh, the reverse has this inscription sacred to the memory of Robert Fulton. In the initial order for this, for this medal, the sides are reversed so that what we call the reverse, the inscription was the obverse and the steamboat was on the reverse, but that's okay. We can live with that. <clears throat> we don't know how many were intended to make, but if we can look at what the expenses were and the price of gold, it would have been possible to have a gold medal struck. <clears throat> gold at the time was $20.69 an ounce. Two ounces would have been $41.38. Uh, after other expenses, they would have had a couple of dollars left over, about 10 for expenses and other metal uh, strikes, but it didn't happen. We, well, we it did end up with a very tight budget and Carrie published the uh, little bit of account to the money and said the $53 went to a Mr. Bird for the dies, $30 to Mr. Pynchon for 12 gilt medals, it was actually double gilt hard metal medals, 40 for white metal medals. And as all good accountants, you know, two sides have to sort of match up. 
$2.77 for printing and other expenses. <clears throat> Harry then finished his report by saying that he had the hope that some wealthy citizens will get together and erect a monument to Fulton. Yeah. So as it happens, the history of the striking of the Fulton Fund Medal has many similarities with the first ANS medal. <clears throat> I'm sure everybody is aware, because I've written it several times, that the first ANS medal for Lincoln uh, was had a die that reportedly broke after 16 strikes. A new die was created, whereupon it was found that the first die wasn't broken quite that badly, and then more strikes were made. In the, in the case of the Fulton medal, after the 12 medals in hard metal, some defect in the seal caused a break of some sort in the die, but it was still usable and they were able to make 40 additional medals in white metal. <clears throat> so you have a total of 52 medals made, 12 in hard metal, 40 in white metal. And here is the distribution of those medals. Five to Mrs. Blight, the daughter of Robert Fulton, none to any of the other children. So we assume that the remaining children would have gotten one, if any, from the five given to Mrs. Blight. One went to the Athenaeum, one to the city library, one to Mr. Uh, Cable, one to Nicholas Biddle, one to Roberts, Mr. Robertson, one to Jackson, and one to Matthew Carey. And here I've described them. Cable was the person who came up with the idea originally. Uh, Robertson was the cashier who sent, was nice enough to send the $80.77 to the fund. Uh, Washington Jackson, as I said, was treasurer. Matthew Carey was the first chairman and basically did most of the work. <clears throat> we have other people involved in this. <clears throat> Albert Bird was the engraver. Uh, seems to be the only person named Burr at the time who really fit the bill. He was active in Philadelphia from roughly 1829 to 1858. He was born there in 1800, uh, lived with his wife, Lydia, had seven, at least seven children. He has a fairly small number of medals that could be uh, credited to him with any sort of um, <clears throat> Uh, accuracy. Uh, there are three political campaign medals that we know about from the 1848 campaign and possibly the 1832 Philadelphia civic procession for the Washington birth centennial. There is a small image of it here on the bottom. This is a great print that I found at the Library Company of Philadelphia. It's co called the Gold and Silver Artificers of Philadelphia in Civic Procession, 22 February, 1832. At the bottom, it has the image of the medal, and you can see the uh, same image appears on the banner that's being carried in the procession. In the center, pulled by horses, is a wagon. On the wagon are uh, members uh, of the union who were striking medals throwing them into the crowd. And at the bottom, you can see uh, some people who were scrambling to pick up the medals that were thrown to them. <clears throat> we don't know which side is attributed to uh, Albert Byrd, but he got one and the other is said to be by Mr. Falwell. I couldn't find any documentation of the period, but these are their notes. Uh, newspapers of the time indicate that Byrd was, for the most part, a respectable individual. Uh, he was active in his church. He was an you know, upstanding member of the community, community except in 1843, uh, he was charged with rape. It seems that he had a young servant girl who was 14 years old in his household, and she fingered him. Uh, and at the trial, she claimed that uh, upon three different occasions, the villain stole into her chamber at the dead of night and violated her person. Her screams could not deter, deter him from his brutal assault. Now, this is you know, pretty damning 
but I could not find a newspaper account that gave the results of the trial. If anything happened, probably not much, because in the following year, there was another newspaper account. Apparently, his youngest daughter died by the malapplication of laudanum, and there was no mention of this earlier trial. And in later um, census records, he's still living and working. So not much, if anything, ever came of that accusation. And uh, we have absolutely no idea what happened to the young maid, Mary Jane McDonald. There were several people who could fit the bill going through old records, but it's a fairly common name. And I just don't know for sure what happened to her. As for William Pynchon, he was born about, seven, he, the guy who struck the medals, he was born about 1787 in Philadelphia. <clears throat> he died in 1862. His father, who was also William Pynchon, was a silversmith. He uh, undoubtedly gave some instruction to his son. Uh, the young Pynchon served in the War of 1812. We know that because uh, after his death, his widow, Mary, applied for a pension and that was granted. It was Captain Hartman Coon's company, First Pennsylvania. And the first appearance we have of William in the city directory is in 1818. He's listed below the entry for his mother. Uh, William is also noted as a silver plater on uh, Jacoby Street. By 1830, he's also listed as a, in the military store business and then as a manufacturer of military and fancy articles. His name shows up in a number of books on uh, button manufacturers. And here we have an order for William Pynchon receiving uh, War Department orders for buttons and forage caps. Um, just to indicate, yeah, he was doing military stores. Now the three buttons on the right are not by uh, Pynchon, but it gives an idea of what type of work he was doing, and perhaps more important, we often hear stories that button manufacturers did a lot of early metals. And for people in the late 20th, early 21st century, the idea of a button, which is basically a piece of plastic or some other um, here with nothing on it except a few holes for sewing, we don't think of buttons as something that has to be stamped in metal. But that was the common way of making metal, of making buttons at the time. So they had the ability to do the die work as well as to stamp these things. So that's why I've got them there. So coming to the end, what do, does any of this really matter? And the easy answer is to say, no, it doesn't. Uh, coin people tend to think that coins, medals, make money and so on, are really the most important thing in the universe. Everything centers around it, it really doesn't. But looking at it from other ways, yeah, it does matter. One, it gives numismatists something to do, or as one of the curators who will remain nameless at the, uh, for the moment, uh, gives academics something to do. Uh, but to be a little serious on it, it does put things into context a little bit. The first is that after the Revolutionary War, the United States needed heroes. We had military heroes. We had political heroes. We didn't have much else. We wanted to replace a lot of our ties to Britain, and that included uh, our the people we looked up to. And we wanted homegrown heroes. We got some from the frontier people like Johnny Appleseed, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and so on. Robert Fulton was one of the first of the inventors, the homegrown inventor who, you know, the idea was that he tinkers in the yard, in the barn, so to speak. He didn't, but it was that sort of idea. He was an early American hero. We needed them, and he was available. Uh, the other thing is that this is the beginning of the American uh, private issuance of medals for commemorative and historic purposes. We were beginning to get political medals. We had uh, government issued medals 
you know, Comitia Americana medals, you had War of 1812 medals, but these are private issues. And some are political or national, such as the George Washington medal, lower right. Uh, but on the upper right, uh, the Erie Canal medal is a civic event. On the lower left is the um, Lafayette medal from his return tour of the United States. It was a somewhat military, but many, in many respects, a social event as well. And on the top, a medal of Edwin Forrest, uh, who was uh, an early actor in the United States, possibly the best known of the period. Uh, this was from a issued at the time of a banquet in New York just before he left uh, for England for two years. But is this a purely civic medal? And this is the, the beginning of what we do as far as medals as a uh, reflection of American history and American life. And that's it. That's all I got. So if you have any questions, happy to hear them. Well, there's see, well, it's more of I guess it's a question in the in the chat. Have you heard of John Fitch, who had a functional yes. scheme up first? I actually did mention him. It, it was functional, but it wasn't practical. It didn't go fast. Uh, I mean, if you could walk faster than the steamboat or a horse and cart could go faster, there was no point. And he never really developed it well, even though he did have a monopoly granted to him. And he was the guy who worked with Henry Voigt, and Voigt beat out as chief coiner. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, we have another comment. Renato, I just bought a 52 millimeter Fulton medal and realized it was not ANS made. Uh, which medal was that? Was that this one or? It is the only 77 millimeter. Oh, the ANS, yeah, the Hudson Fulton medals of 1909. There was a 76 or 77 millimeter. Uh, metal that was the ANS issue, but it came in a wide variety of sizes and metals uh, that were issued by other uh, parts of the celebration. I just oh, you said sad. I don't know. I'm. Uh... I'm, I'm Jim McClellan, and I uh, taught for many years at Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. Ah, another name that shows up in early steamboats. That's right. And, you know, you, you talk to the people at Stevens. Uh, yeah, Robert Fulton did something, but uh, Colonel John Stevens beat them all out. I, I, I don't think know he if was uh, Livingston's brother-in-law, and Livingston left his association with Stevens to work with Fulton. Yeah, it's a close-knit group, if you will. But Fulton never really liked to give any credit to anybody whose work he, he appropriated or even learned from. Well, thank you. It, eight all considered a poor showing. What would have been acceptable after four years? Um, Oh, what would be acceptable? I don't know <laughs> what would be acceptable to if people took were able to give two dollars a year as a group. I mean, individuals were able to give more than that. So I, I would have thought they were hoping for thousands, mm -hmm. so some thousands of dollars at least. Uh, <clears throat> basically. Robert Fulton was one of the first people to completely change um, commerce and industry and transportation in the United States. You know, the really first popular use of steam engine for all of these things. Uh, trains came just a little bit later. And for everybody to get, to, hopefully get together, or at least some people, because steam travel was not cheap. Steam travel, the first fare between New York and Albany was priced at $7, but he accepted $6 from the first passenger. 
seven dollars. That's that's the equivalent of several hundred dollars today. Uh, stagecoach was about ten dollars, but travel from for you know a couple of hundred miles was not something that most people did very easily. Uh, so for four years, they received approximately what it costs for one person to travel from New York to Albany. Does that answer the question? Hopefully. <laughs> How many surviving examples of travel? I don't know. I know about half a dozen off the top of my head. I wrote to, I think it was the library company, uh, and they didn't bother to answer yet. Um, a few other places that should have examples don't seem to have it, at least in their public listings. So I'm not sure if they do have it, they got rid of it, or they just don't know what they have. But my guess is probably a third at least would still be around. Most people just don't know what it is. It is, Patrick, it's the Athenaeum. I assume it's, there was one in Philadelphia, still trying to track some of the stuff down. Uh, every, all of this was centered around Philadelphia. Did you have a question, Mr. Brooks? <laughs> I feel like he was trying to get in there before. I just like to say thank you very much to Scott. You know, I always enjoy his programs. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.